Hi, thank you so much for joining us. This is Eric L. Dunavant, the Mindset Disruption Strategist. Welcome to another episode of Redefining Success, the Kingdom Builders Spotlight. And I, today's guest, I just need to tell you, like has been encouraging me for going on around 20 years. Uh, this man, Gunnar Johnson, that I'm going to tell you more about in just a minute, has been a spiritual mentor, has been a business mentor, and some of that from afar and some of that up close. He's challenged me at times in really, really good ways. Um, you know, I, but the scripture says iron sharpens iron, and Gunnar definitely is iron um, to me and to many other believers out there. He has an incredible story, an incredible journey that you want to stick around and hear about. But today, He's president and CEO of Bigfoot Drywall and Paint in Colorado Springs. And from what I can tell, expanding and growing. And I'll let him tell more about that. And then also he is a stewardship advisor to ICM, which is the International Cooperative Ministry. Um, and he's going to weave all of this together. It is so cool. We talk about redefining success, this idea of what if what we've been called to, the way that the world tells us to do it, is not going to work. But if we plug into kingdom principles and God principles, there actually is a way to do things beyond anything we can imagine. And that's part of what Gunnar's going to share with us today. So Gunnar, thank you so much for agreeing to be the guest on the show today. Uh, thank you, Eric. It's great to hang out with you again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've missed it. Um, hey, for the audience, because I could just jump right in, but for the audience, give them kind of a 30,000 foot view of kind of you, your life, your family, the business kind of, and even I think we can do an abridged version of your story. Um, as we were talking about before we came on the show, I think we could do three or four episodes of your story. Um, but for the sake of today, give us a, give us a brief overview. Well, I, I own a drywall company here in Colorado that does several hundred homes a year and is growing over 400% a year. And it's a it's a ministry to us. It's our it's our business's missions ministry. We do drywall and paint both, but I also serve as um, as a eternal investment broker, stewardship advisor for International Cooperative Ministry. Um, we plant churches, we build hope centers all around the world, and we also do discipleship resources for um, reaching people. And um, you, you know that. The crazy thing is the Lord has brought me through just a, a lot of ministry, um, mm -hmm. starting starting back when I was on staff with Larry Burkett in Crown Financial Ministry in South Florida. Then um, yeah, I owned a, a drywall business back then. I was bivocational uh, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. I went into 15 years of church ministry where I was an executive pastor at Gateway Church. Um, watched a church go from a couple thousand people to 36,000 in attendance. Um, I've, I've had the privilege to travel all over the world speaking on the Bible and money. That's, that's been my specialty and where you and I have connected a lot is just um, uh, you are iron as well and you've challenged me and encouraged me and just been a great friend learning and growing as we walk as disciples behind our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And uh, this particular area of, of money and the way we spend our life, the way we spend our, our treasure is, is so, so valuable and so important, um, not only to us, but to the heart of God and the way, we, mm. the way we spend this precious commodity called time. So, yeah, you know, it's great to hang out with you and uh, looking forward to the conversation that follows. Yeah. So, I mean, it, you, you talk about this a lot. I mean, that you, as you were kind of going through the story, I mean, it's time with Larry Burkett and time in churches and um, I think one of the things that's interesting to me, especially with your wisdom and your experience that I do want to spend some time on is just this idea of how much the Bible really does say about money, mm -hmm. how much, you know, money weaves in and out of our lives. And one of the things both you and I have seen, which is true, is in the world's definition of success, typically there's this idea that the wider and higher you pile it up, then you're winning like that. That yeah. is success. Right. Tell us a little bit kind of over the years of what you've seen and, and, and what you've experienced, kind of like what you've seen in God's word and scripture versus what you've seen in people. And then even how God's word can transform and change people through the experience of beginning to truly understand what his word says. Well, if I'm to be 100 percent honest, this topic had been one 
that I've struggled with immensely over the years. Um, I bought a Kim Dry carpet cleaning franchise in my early 20s, and I was the youngest franchise owner, and I, I really had a great deal for God. My deal was, I, I'm going to get really, really rich, Lord, and I'm going to give you a portion of of what I make, like maybe 10%. And, and because of the wealth I'm going to generate, um, it'll be a blessing to you and the churches. And, you know, I found that I was really an idolatrous, materialistic idol worshiper. Yeah. I, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out like, okay, so I'm following Jesus because it's kind of like fire insurance. You know, I, I knew that I had to have some way to cover my sin. I, I wasn't capable of that. So I'd accepted Christ at 17. But okay, now that I'm saved, now what? What's the mission? Well, in my mind, uh, as a young man, my, my mission was I'm going to make as much money as I can, and I'm going to drive the coolest cars that I can, and um, you know I'm going to throw a few dollars towards Jesus. Well, I got challenged in Bible studies about money that really that was nothing more than a rich young ruler trying to justify their own self-righteousness and, and sinful nature. Well, I was a rich young ruler, and generosity is an is one of the antidotes there's mm. i think there's several but generosity challenged me uh, the bible challenged me on on giving everything away and in in being and when i say giving everything away i don't just mean money the, the money part's actually the easier part of all of that it's mm. lord what do you want with my day today what do you want with my family um what, what do you want with my kids and the, the influence you you bring me, how do I steward that for the kingdom I manage that for the growth of the kingdom? So, you know, I've, I've been through a few iterations of life. Like uh, I, I thought if I could find a way to become a pastor, then, then I'd find, um, you know, happiness and holiness. And, and what I found as a pastor is that, Hey, uh, pastors struggle with money too. They, it's a hard issue and they struggle with generosity and pride and arrogance and, of uh, fame and fortune and the, this whole evangelical celebrity culture. And I'm like, Oh shoot. I didn't find, I didn't find what I was looking for there. So then Lord, it must be business, right? Um, business wasn't the be all end all. Mm. And so where I ended up over, over 20 uh, something years, almost 30 years of being a disciple is um, every, every season of our life has a different focus. And when we seek first the kingdom, like I know your your one of your favorite verses, Matthew six thirty three. Absolutely. What does that righteousness look like? Mm. How do we seek first the kingdom? What does it mean for God to add things to us? And in the season of life that I'm in now, um, it, it is to 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 have my discipleship around the Jerusalem area, mm -hmm. being my drywall company here in Colorado Springs Monument. We serve all the way up to Denver. How do I serve and love people who would not darken the doors of a church? Yeah, um, we're we're a outspoken Christian company, which means we hold ourselves to a certain value set in in the way we conduct business, the way we we work with our teams. We have over over 100 tradesmen that work with us, and um, you know what does it mean to to seek the kingdom there? Sometimes it's stopping to pray over a a, a tradesman or a colleague that's going through a tough time. Sometimes it's confronting uh, it's confronting things that aren't God honoring, mm. and um, I, I lead a lot of I lead a lot of men to Christ. I deepen discipleship way more in the business world than I ever did in the church world. <laughs> in fact, a little, little side note of that. I, oh, please. I left I left the church world thinking I or having this realization that I don't see enough non Christians in my life. I was hanging mm. out with awesome church people. They were good people, good godly people. I loved them. But I looked around, I'm like, I don't know any lost people. Like hmm. outside of people that would go to church and don't really know the Lord. I mean, I don't know people that are heathen. Yeah. And um, so I, I bought a Harley, which is what you're supposed to do and go find <laughs> heathens. <laughs> and I started hanging out at the Harley shop and um, I actually got criticized by uh, some of the senior leadership for having lost friends or, or being around people that weren't Christians. Cause here I am as an executive pastor in a, in a, in a high net worth environment. And I was like, you know what? I kind of see Jesus being a guy that hung out with people that you got criticized for. Yeah, absolutely. So eventually it led to this um, kind of discontentment in my world that I really wanted, I wanted lost people in my life, mm. not so that I could be influenced by them, but so that I could, that I could 
share Christ and witness to people who weren't going to show up for free donuts at church. These are people who were running from the Lord and the Lord was yeah. pursuing them. It's, uh, it's like the story of the, the lost coin, the lost sheep. I wanted to be one with the uh, father chasing after the lost people. So, so when I started the construction business, it was kind of an interesting, interesting thing. I was burned out on ministry. Mm. I was just overall burned out. It was 2019. I had traveled the previous year with Learn Generosity, which is my church consulting company. I'd spoken about 50 times. I was on an airplane about 250,000 miles in 2018, 2019. I was like, man, I... Uh, I'm going to take a break and just do a little bit of construction, get, you know, get some time with my audio Bible and, and just be away from people. Right. Yeah. Well, the Lord had another idea. Um, he started opening doors for me. I, I spent eight weeks in big sky in Montana, um, really? working at the Yellowstone club in isolation alone, completely quiet all day. I wouldn't talk to anybody. I was staying at a friend's house up there while doing some project work in the Yellowstone Club, which if you're not familiar with the Yellowstone Club, like the cheap houses are 15 million. The averages are like 40, 50 million. You can't get in without a background check. It's like awesome. They they hire former Secret Service agents to be the security guards. I mean, it's exclusive. Yeah. And um, so I was staying at a friend's house in isolation doing some drywall work. Uh, working with my hands and being an anonymous and all of a sudden the Lord gave me a word to build my drywall company as my church mm. and I didn't know what that meant but I started asking like okay well that phrase was going through my mind over and over and over what does that actually mean I'm a one-man shop I'm just being I'm in seclusion I'm hiding from everybody mm. um, and all of a sudden I start getting calls from builders in Colorado Springs um, came back from Montana to Colorado and landed a handful of subdivisions, like not just one house, but like <laughs> tons of houses. And so I started advertising and hiring tradesmen, hiring office staff, and um, and the company just exploded from there. And that was all well and good, except for I had a wrestling in my spirit. Okay, now I've got my drywall company as my church. Well, how do I deal with this call that I've had on my life to plant churches all over the world? I mean, I don't have the time to do this. There's no way. Yeah. <clears throat> the Lord led me to um, to begin working with ICM to to help invest, help investors give money to raise church buildings all around the world. And this has been a real incredible blessing. I started with them in December, and just the the worldwide impact, hearing people's stories over and over and over who have had this epiphany of the kingdom and the in business and how to expand the kingdom and you know, I'm I'm super excited that I not only have my little drywall business to, you know, to reach people hands on here in my region, but also get to leverage it all across the world to build churches and hope centers and everything else with ICM in partnership with uh, ministries all around the world. So, you know, I, if you had told me five years ago that this would be my life today, I'd have never believed it. Hmm. Absolutely never. <laughs> Well, as a disciple, there's such an adventure following Jesus. And as a disciple, we lose the self-directive will. You know, yeah. if we're really following Jesus, that means we're following. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I do want to, I want to come back to this whole, you know, churches, your, your business or church or whatever you kind of say in there. There's a, there's a phrase you may, <clears throat> you know, Rick Beatenbow, the Beatenbow Homes. If you, anyway, out of Lubbock, Texas. He made this comment that just has stuck with me for years. He said, people don't have to go to church, but they do have to go to work. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really good. That really kind of, that settled with me. I was like, wow, that's powerful. But I think one of the things that I really want you to kind of dive into a little bit more, Gunner, is if I'm, if I'm listening to this show and I'm not living in this world, especially when we've got a counterculture world, we've got a world that's like, hey, don't talk, we don't talk about that here. Like, we feel like we need to put things in boxes. Like, if I'm a believer running a business, I think there's almost like a caution of like, I've got to put my faith on the side. I cannot be faith forward in the culture that we live in. Um, from a kingdom perspective, we know that that's not true, that there are things that are different, but 
kind of tell me what you would say to that person that's like that that worked for you and I'm glad that worked out but I just don't know that that'd work in my community or work for me every business is different so the discipleship options are going to look a little different um it doesn't mean that we should be covert Christians and not share our, our witness um I'm in I'm a member of C12 which is a business CEO group and um we were just talking about this this last week and in my environment in the construction world i can be a little more outspoken about my faith but the lady sitting next to me runs a medical practice uh she she has she and her husband he's a doctor they have um a large medical practice and they still share their faith they're very outspoken and you know as i as i thought about well okay so this works in my world but how would it work for xyz all these different walks of industry, if a believer is committed to the walk of Christ and they're asking him the question, how do I exhibit the kingdom in my workplace? He'll show them how to do it. He'll give them the strategy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had made up excuses for everybody in the room. Like, well, this worked for me, but maybe not for them. That guy owns an insurance company. He's like, oh no, here's how I do it. Well, that guy owns a software technology company. And he's like, well, here's how I do it. Um, I don't think the Lord's out of ideas for how we can be a witness. <laughs> And I don't mean being obnoxious, standing out front of the parking lot as people pull up with a megaphone shouting, you know, turn or burn or (laughs) handing out tracts in the office. Those kind of things are probably not the best idea. But, you know, I've never had a I've never had a tradesman. And and you got to remember, drywall workers are tough human beings. Mm -hmm. They they are rough and tough. They are, you know, I kind of picture fishermen of Jesus's day. They are not the sensitive type. Um. But I've never had one decline a prayer. Hey, man, can I pray for you today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what, what's going on in your world? What can I pray for specifically? Well, um, I don't know. Maybe pray for my marriage. Okay, cool. Let's pray. They've ne- I've never had anyone say, I don't, I don't want you to pray. I mean, even if it's, <laughs> I think with some of these guys, it's like, well, it's the Hail Mary. Maybe it works, and I don't want to decline that. <laughs> so, but um, to many of them, to many of the guys that work with me, um, I have put God to the test over and over and over in front of them. Guys, we've got a cash flow deficit. Let's pray. Let's see what God does. And then miraculously, things will come about and we'll cover these expenditures. We'll have the cash we need. And it's like, I told you God to deliver on this. <laughs> or, or we have someone get sick or an injury and we pray over them and they heal up a lot faster than normal um there has been so many so many different stories of different people that have have come to me for prayer uh one of the guys in my company that runs part of our division he uh, his wife committed suicide two years ago and um, i connected with him through one of our painters who said i've got a friend who's just really in depression sitting on the couch could use a friend um here's what happened i said well give him my phone number let's let me let me talk to him we ended up talking for a couple of months. I hired him, brought him on to to run <clears throat> to run our paint division. And this last weekend, he he had a tough weekend. And I said, "Man, I'm I'm praying for you this weekend." And that meant the world to him. And by the way, he's performing really well. Yeah. Took him a little bit to get his legs underneath him again, but he's performing really well in the company and thriving and happy. Yeah. And um, you, you know, I I'm thankful for these type of um opportunities they are unique completely unique one of the things um my son's 21 20 um sophomore in college and you know i mean there's a lot of cultural things right now that are on this like big companies and like this kind of this whole like capitalism's bad you know this whole capitalism's bad and this idea (laughs) of and one of the things he and i were having a conversation about was you know that's that's kingdom versus not kingdom because inside a kingdom and inside of a kingdom business, what you do is you align people and profit. You understand how valuable your people are to you. Your people are the reason that you have profit. So you, you, a kingdom principle is to be able to discover how to love, how to pray for your people, how to love them more, how to serve them more, how to be interactive with them more, as opposed to seeing them as a commodity. And it's really kind of crazy how in today's world, you're seeing a frustration bubble up among a generation and and I don't know if you're seeing the same thing, but what it really feels like is it's it's a lack of kingdom in business that they sit and they don't, they don't even know it. Well, part of the 
part of the mission of Bigfoot Drywall is to bring honor to the tradesmen. Mm -hmm. And I've looked around and the Department of Labor says there's about 170,000 drywall jobs in the nation. And there's about 1.2 to 1.5 million houses being built. So you can real quickly start doing the math and realize that's not, that's not enough. So there's probably more like eight or 900,000 drywall workers. It's just 700,000 of them are illegal, you know? Mm. And, and so we, we've been really, we, we have fought for higher wages for our tradesmen and we've found ways to help the immigrant among us legally work, not hiring illegals, but legally finding the ways to help them get, get on their path to citizenship and to, to, to give them honor and respect and they are taken advantage of. Um, I can remember having a, a conversation with a big builder in our, our region, national builder. The pricing they pay would not allow you to have a livable wage, insurance, you know, general liability, workman's comp, and, and be able to cover your expenditures. It, they're just, and so I told the guy, I said, you, you are, you're abusing our tradesmen. This mm -hmm. is an unfair wage. There's, um, and I said, quite frankly, I know where I can find all the tradesmen I need because I can pay a lot more. And we've had builders who've come up to our price point um, to, to pay a fair wage. And we pay, we pay better than average in our region. And we point back to the fact that, that God has a heart for the immigrant among us. Yeah. And, it, it, and we're not going to take advantage of workers. We're not going to cheat them. We're not going to steal from them. We're also going to give a good product to the builder and serve them and, and do a great job. But um, we're not gonna do it at the expense of, of ripping off other people. And, you know, honestly, there was a little season where I thought I'm not gonna be able to get any work with this mentality. Um, it, our particular trade is like the bottom run of all the, the skilled labor on the job site. Yeah. Um, you don't usually meet a drywall finisher or a drywall hanger in a cocktail party. And they tell you, <laughs> hey, I'm a drywall guy. The carpenters, the electricians, they'll probably tell you what they do, but not the drywall guys. They're kind of, you know, kind of lowly. Yeah. And um, we sought to bring honor to them. And that has resonated with a lot of our young people that mm -hmm. are coming out of the high school, college age and coming into our company to learn the trade. Um, it's becoming cool again to be able to work with your hands. Yeah. And we, we, we are bringing honor back into this trade and showing them how to make a good living doing something that is respectable. Hard, it's hard work, but it's, a, it's an honorable trade. And, and the builders that we are working with are beginning to see the value in treating people with respect and honor and dignity. And we're outgrowing all of our competition in the drywall world because I don't treat our guys like dogs. I treat them with respect. It's a flat, it's a flat leadership structure in my mind. I'm no more valuable than the guy that's picking up sheetrock on my job site. I love that. I love those guys. I take good care of them. And because I honor them and they, they're treated with respect, they tell their friends, <laughs> builders see a difference in the product we're putting out. Yep. And um, it's changing an industry in our region, I believe. Yeah, I, I excited to see what happens. I mean, you're talking about 400% growth and you started what, two years ago, three? Yeah, two years ago. Two years ago and to just kind of see your growth. And, but this, this comes back to, I mean, we started on, I mean, this is kingdom principle, right? It's like, you know, a business consultant might come in and tell you, you need to do it completely differently, you know, but it's like, no, this is a kingdom ideal. This is a kingdom way of how we treat our people. And that's what I love about this and love about your story and love about just doing this. Is like, that's the one thing we find over and over and over again is that God rewards following his kingdom, seeking yeah. it out. Um, talk a little bit about, you and I talked about this before we, we started the interview, but I mean, you've got this business growing 400% and you're still being a stewardship advisor to a nonprofit. So, I mean, how do you pull that off with the amount of work that's grown? From the very beginning, I shared with my leadership team that God's called me to help um, in the ministry um, with the church world. And, you know, the, the, the team that's come around me has seen that as a value to them. They, they are also, uh, if not men of God, they, they're, they're people who respect the church. Mm -hmm. And so as opportunities have come up, uh, there's been some grace for 
you know, my role, like what, what's needed from me at Bigfoot Drywall. It's visionary leadership. I'm the chief fire putter outer. <laughs> I close sales on big accounts, that kind of thing. But um, I also share kingdom wins. I talk about how we're reaching the people of Mozambique or Madagascar or the projects we're doing in India or Brazil. I, I talk about the wins of the, of the ministry. We are, um, as, a, as a company, we're looking to invest to build churches in Mexico where a lot of our tradesmen are coming from. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a tradesman from Honduras. I was telling him about the ministry uh, that ICM does in, in Honduras. And he was getting really excited because to him, the, you know, the, you know, you know, all the little cities and provinces around New Orleans really well. It'd be like uh, me telling you about what we're doing in ministry over there. So um, it's really been interesting to see how these worlds have, have collided. But the other flip side to it is God's given me the time I've needed to be successful in both endeavors. And mm -hmm. I can sit across from a business leader and tell them how I rearrange my schedule um, to, to be able to do both work for ICM and planting churches and uh, meeting with donors that are investing in the kingdom. And, and I'm doing the same thing they are. I'm bivocational. I'm funded by my drywall company. Right, uh, right. And, that, and that's, you know, we all have every excuse in the book to, to not pursue the scary things God calls us to. Um, but taking one step at a time, it's just like Peter taking that step out of the boat. God will, God will give him, I'll give you the strength and the, the solid ground underneath you each step of the way, keeping your eyes on him. <laughs> I love that. I love that story of Peter. Um, I had somebody look, look at me one time and said, the only difference between you and Peter right now is Peter got out of the boat. So are you going to get out of the boat? That's right. And even if it's not our season to be hands-on doing active ministry work around the world, that may not be your calling. As Christian business leaders, we can still carve off a piece of our, mm. our profits to invest in things that make a difference. I mean, why why build sandcastles as you said earlier yeah. think, why not be an eternal investment broker putting our money into something that will make a difference in the lives of many i was with a business leader the other day um who invests in icm does does when i say invest i mean giving money to, to plant churches sure sure he he told me he said um he said uh, the report the impact report that he received he and his wife figured out that all the churches they've built, which is about 150 churches, he said there's 2 million people on a Sunday morning worshiping in churches that they built with their company. Is he that said right? that's staggering. Yeah. And I mean, the ROI for the kingdom is really high around the world. Um, ICM is building churches in third world countries for less than $10 a square foot. I mean, $13,500, you can build a church. We're not wow. talking millions and millions of dollars yeah these are small investments that make a massive impact in the kingdom that's exciting <laughs> that gets me excited yeah i know yeah, i can super, hear it super cool i can hear it <laughs> gunner you and i could be on as i said you and i could be on the phone and on this zoom call for a long time and we, we probably ought to do this again and my my one question before i wrap things up is is there anything I didn't ask you that like is on your heart right now or anything kind of perspective that you want to make sure you share uh, before we wrap up. Well, if you look at um, the parable of the soils in, um, I didn't pull the address to it and I'm drawing a blank. The one soil that got choked out by materialism and wealth mm. is the one soil that I believe we, um, we struggle with as American business leaders. Yeah. We can get wrapped up in the cool and great things, the honorable things of our businesses and forget to be good fruit bearing uh, disciples in the kingdom. And so, you know, as we become more profitable in our business endeavors, the question that I had to sit down and really wrestle through is, Lord, how much is enough? Mm. And if I reach the milestones I'm looking at, what does that mean for my investment in the kingdom? Um, I don't want to waste any opportunity. Carpe diem, seize the day. Yeah. Um, Lord, what is the opportunity for the American business culture, not only in reaching our employees and customers for Christ, but leveraging our impact around the world? 
Um, I only want to be involved in high rate of return investments of my time. Yep. And um, I don't know what that looks like in the lives of all of your listeners. It looks different for everybody. But I do guarantee you this. If you'll begin to sit down and ask the Lord those questions, he'll begin to answer them clearly, tangibly, in a way that you can live them out. So true fulfillment in the kingdom isn't just making money or, or even, even just making disciples. It's being faithful to what God calls us to do. Yeah. Faithfulness. That's, I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. That's it. I will. I'm going to. I may take us a little bit longer, but I'm going to share a perspective of something that I've been seeing lately that you brought up when you when you said that, which has been, a, it's a challenge to me, right? So everything, I think for you as well, right? Everything always starts out as, yeah, this is something I'm really wrestling with. And then it becomes a message or something you feel called to go chase down. So, and so all of you who are listening, just understand this started out as my problem. Um, but I started looking at that in our world today, the modern day kings in one sense, our business owners, they're people running businesses. And, um, and then I go and I look at the example of the Kings in the old Testament and the level of failure that happened over and over and over again, there were successes, but in almost every failure, what it was, was they didn't tear down all the idols. They left the idols in place. And in business in America today, it is so easy for us to put up an idol, not just a financial, but I did, an idol of taxes, an idol of retirement, an idol of business growth. And I, it's, so, it's so easy to take any little thing and prop it up as an idol rather than God. What and It's that question, right, that we keep Matthew 6, 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. But I just encourage everyone who's listening to is just understand that the rest of the world is speaking to you to encourage you to put up idols. It's the reason that being grounded in scripture and understanding what God is calling you to do becomes so important. And I want to give you a, a moment to comment on that. And then I'll kind of conclude. Uh, you're, you're spot on. Um, you know, one of the scriptures that came to mind as you were speaking was, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Mm. Um our world is a distraction making machine. Yeah. Um, and yet it can be leveraged for a kingdom building experience. Um, there's so many ways to waste our life. Yeah. I don't want to be one that has wasted my life building the wrong idols, building the wrong sand castles. <laughs> the question that I wrestle with all the time is Lord, what are you calling me to in this season and how can I impact? generations to come through through the work of christ mm. for all of eternity we're going to stand with all the christians who ever walked the face of the earth and i i want to be able to i want to be able to say you know what for my generation i leveraged everything god gave me every opportunity he gave me to have an investment in the kingdom i don't want comfort i don't want pleasure i don't want anything outside of the will of god that doesn't mean I don't take vacations. I don't enjoy things. I've got a cool Tesla. I've got some fun toys. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a poverty mentality guy, but at the same time, everything that's in my world, it either has to build or build or break down the kingdom. Mm. So, mm. And by the way, that, um, <laughs> that address for the parable of soils, Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> if, if we, if you have a moment for your listeners, if you have a moment in your discipleship time to look up that, that parable, I, I would ask that you ask the Lord, where do you fit within that paradox? And is there something that he's asking you to change? And if it's scary, praise God, that's part of the adventure. <laughs> <laughs> I was comfortable in the mega church world as an executive pastor. You know, I had a good salary. I had a great job. I was doing good things. I worked with wonderful people. But you know what? God had a different adventure for me that has been terrifying. Uh, managing payroll, cash flow, taxes, insurances, builders, sub, subs and trades. I mean, this is different. And then once I get comfortable and settled with that, now you're going to use me to, to, to help encourage and, and plant churches all over the world through ICM? My goodness, Lord. <laughs> Can I handle this? Right. Yeah. 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 Because he's in not, it. Really. Be, yeah. But he can because yeah. <laughs> he's in it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Gunnar, thank you. Um, 
one of the things that you were telling me a little bit about this before we came on, I'll share with you guys this Generous Life Journey is a book that Gunnar wrote. What, when did you, how long ago did you write this? I know you said there's new versions of this, but. Uh, oh, I think I wrote it in 2015. Okay. Um, there's a newer ver version of, of the book, um, 2015, 2016, Generous Life Journey. Um, I'm, I, I, I give those books away. So um, yeah, I'm funded in ministry through the drywall company. So if anyone that's listening to your show, you can, you can give them my email address and um, I'll send them a book. Well, that was going to be my next it. question. So what's, if someone's listening and they're like, this is fascinating. I want to know a little bit more about what Gunner's doing. I want to get in touch with Gunner yeah. and maybe, so what's the best way to reach you? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, email me at G Johnson, J O H N S O N at ICM.org. Okay. Yeah. That's the easiest way to find me. The other, you know, just, Look me up on social media. Um, Bigfootconstruction.org is our, our website. I love connecting with people on all forms of social media. So, yeah, uh, don't be strangers. Gunnar, this has been awesome. As I said, I feel like I could we could sit here for another hour or two, but in respect of our audience and uh, of your time as well, um, I'm going to cut it off for today. But thank you so much for making the time to be here. Thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing your story. Me. Uh, thank you, sir. Well, it's always a privilege and honor to hang out with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We need to do it more. We need to do it more. Thank you so much for listening. Um, we'll be here again next week. God bless you. Have a great day.